And turning now to Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 10. First Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And our subject is uh, uh, the apostles' thankfulness for miracles. Not the miracles that some people look for, but the greatest miracle, and we're seeing a bird's eye view here of the mission that he conducted in the city of the Thessalonians. About uh, AD 51, 50, and this letter, as I've uh, pointed out in past studies, was written within a year of the planting of the church there. And uh, the apostle with uh, Silas and Timothy had preached the gospel with remarkable results. He had turned up in this city, exhausted after a long, long journey from Philippi, where he'd been cruelly beaten and ill-treated. And he and Silas, both aged men for the day, and the younger, Timothy, came tired into the city and immediately got down to the work of preaching the gospel, but with extraordinary results and many, many conversions. And here in these verses, he gives us an insight into the conduct of that mission in that city of some 200,000 people, a very prosperous, a very proud city. And I look at the 10th verse, ye are witnesses, just, just to a, a, a quick overview or survey before we proceed, look at the compact and uh, uh, wonderful way in which these verses pass from scene to scene. In verse 9 there, uh, you look at the hard work of the apostle. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. He worked with his hands. We preached unto you the gospel of God, constant preaching and helping people and answering questions and working with his own hands. So there's the labor of verse 9 and the effort. It's interesting that some people these days in our Bible-believing churches seem to think that all you should do is pray for revival. Well, that's right and proper, but it's not all we should do because here in this ninth verse, you see the labor and travail. Two very strong words in the Greek. The hard toil, painful toil, is indicated by them. So that's the ninth verse. And you pass to the tenth into another topic. Ye are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably. Well, look at the terms. We behaved ourselves among you that believe. And you see the holy living of the evangelists and the example that they set and the wonderful lives that they showed to the citizens in that place and to the believers. And then you pass on so smoothly to verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. We'll look at those terms. But there is this almost parental care and this great uh, concern to speak to the hearts of the people and to deal tenderly with them. They weren't raving shouters. They were people who communicated. And it was obvious to their hearers that they were concerned that they should understand and respond. They appealed, they implored. So you can see all the parental Concern, their spirit, the whole spirit of the evangelists was so tender. And then it moves to verse 3, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. You see, their motive, their motive was the ultimate reformation of the people, that they would be saved, that they would have new lives, that they would walk with God, that they would be assured that they would have a tremendous experience of communion with God. They weren't interested in just 
preaching to them and then counting hands or heads and going on their way. Their spirit is revealed here. They have a motive. We're here to see people blessed and transformed and changed. And then into verse 13, the fruit. For this cause we also thank we God without ceasing because... When ye received the word of God, there was a great miracle in their hearts. When ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So there are the steps. Hard work, holy living, parental almost care of the people, the aim that the people would be blessed long term in their spiritual experience and then the fruit, though it's not exactly cause and effect, it's God who works all the way through. But there is a miracle, a great change in their understanding. So we'll consider these things. But you see, under the inspiration of the Spirit, the Apostle writes in such a flowing manner and one principle moves to another and we see the different stages or aspects of the the whole ethos of the mission in that great city so I come back to verse 10 and we go a little slower and this is the foundation of the lives of the apostles I'll pass over verse 9 uh, and go straight to verse 10 ye are witnesses it is said very solemnly. The language takes on almost the scale of an oath. Ye are witnesses, and God also. Something very solemn is about to be said, which they affirm. How holily and justly and unblameably, holily, it means how rightly, or purely or piously we behaved. How we behaved as the representatives of God, worthy of him. And how justly, how conforming to the law of God, to the Ten Commandments. So he calls upon them to remember what it was like when he and Silas and Timothy were among them. How they carried themselves, how they behaved in all things. He could have said, but he doesn't go into detail. You remember our patience? You remember the affection that we had for you? You remember our manner of speech? You never heard anything wrong from our lips? You never heard a word of blasphemy? You never had any intemperate language, any testiness, any ill temper or ill patience? You remember our honesty in all things, how scrupulously careful we were. You remember our unselfishness. Of course, Paul can't very well say all these things, but he does call attention to their Christ-likeness and their righteous walk before God. No temper, no shouting, no peevishness, no gossip, no laziness, no selfishness, no looking after ourselves and our comforts. You didn't see anything like that, the apostle might well have said. So it starts really with the foundation of the mission. With the evangelists like that, close to the Lord and living righteous lives, then the Holy Spirit can bless with we as God's people, living to please him and to honor him, concerned for personal holiness. Then he can bless our Sunday schools and our services and our preaching and our witness and all that we do. So you see here a glimpse of the mission in the city of the Thessalonians. And it begins here with the hard work of verse 9, but we're starting today with the holiness and of course it was so precious and so valuable because not only did it mean that the Holy Spirit could work 
but it meant that the, it was a witness to those people. They were astonished. Their pagan priests didn't behave like this. They weren't genuine men, earnest men, pious men, people around them. They were amazed by it. It was a powerful witness. But also it paved the way for the work of the Spirit. The Spirit can move when the people of God are concerned to strive for holiness. So here it is. Unblameably in verse 10. You can't rack your brains and think of anything you could have charged us with or held against us or any secret sin that you discovered in us. You remember how we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And it wasn't put on. It came out of a life of prayer, an earnest hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And that God could bless and God could use those instruments. And then we come to the 11th verse and the next principle. Verse 10 seems to give the foundation of holiness. Verse 11 is the spirit of the evangelists, their, their disposition, I might say. <clears throat> As ye know how we exhorted, some would translate it implored, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Now, of course, <clears throat> they did speak to individuals and they answered every question that was put to them and groups would come round them. They did a great deal of personal ministry. But primarily, this all flows out of verse 9. We preached unto you the gospel of God. And the verses that follow are still primarily speaking about the preaching. Though there was no doubt much personal interaction too. And I mention this because verse 11 applies first to the preaching. As ye know how we exhorted, comforted, charged, pleaded with, every one of you, as a father doth his children. <clears throat> Now, this is challenging and interesting. As a father, of course, the Apostle Paul has in mind ideal fathers or, at times, all fathers. But a father does his children. A father doesn't speak over the heads of his children. <clears throat> There's the household, boys, girls, maybe a few, maybe many. But if there is correction to be done or encouragement to be given, the father speaks to them. And so the preacher should speak to the people in his manner. He's trying to reach people. He isn't just giving an exposition. He is, of course, expounding the scripture. He must do that. But he isn't just giving an exposition as though there were a glass bubble around the pulpit. And as long as we explain it all, and unfold it all, that's all that is to be done. No, there are people there, and the people must feel that it's for them, and it must be applied to them, and uh, they must be in mind, and all their conditions and circumstances must be helped and comforted and addressed. So there must be a connection. Now, that is the whole basis of preaching. Some people, they don't get it and uh, <clears throat> their congregations never feel that they are in mind, that they are addressed, that their needs are being met, that their circumstances are being considered and helped. And it's a <clears throat> great aspect. This is what Paul has in mind here. This is a word for all who preach. We, you know, ye you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you exhorted from the verb to call near you were appealed to and implored and persuaded you were comforted encouraged consoled and you were charged 
Tyndale translates that rather wonderfully, besought, it's an old fashioned word, how we exhorted, comforted, and besought, pleaded with, he gets it there. Every one of you, every condition, every situation, when we preach the gospel, we have to try to preach to every kind of sinner, every condition. Of course, we're not speaking to everybody one by one, but the preacher must bear in mind, have I addressed the willful rebel? Have I addressed the confused mind who needs convincing? Have I addressed this kind of rebel against God, that kind of rebel against God? The arguments are all there in the scripture. So when the apostle says this, he's speaking first and foremost about what they did as preachers, how they charged every one of you. I must speak to all sorts and conditions of men and women, he said to himself. I must appeal to every hindrance, every kind of unbelief, every hesitation, and reason and persuade. So we're seeing, first of all, a picture of the preaching. And of course, also it was translated into personal ministry. But verse 11 gives the spirit of the evangelists, the apostle Paul, and also of Silas and Timothy. The connection had to be made. Individuals had to be persuaded and helped and challenged and comforted whether unbelievers or believers. So you see their holiness and you see their spirit. But before we leave this 11th verse, as a father doth his children. Well, let's take Paul's example for a moment. What are we like as fathers with our children? <clears throat> verse 7 the Apostle Paul has already used the mother. We were gentle among you. Even as a nurse, he has in mind a mother, a nursing mother, cherisheth her children. And now he's got the father as an example. Charged every one of you, besought every one of you, as a father doth his children. <clears throat> Do fathers take sufficient interest in their children? It's no good a father or a mother come to that being a good reprover if you haven't first of all been a good friend. If you don't follow the interests in your, of your children, not in an overbearing way, not crushing their spirits, not taking over their life, but nevertheless taking an interest and a close interest and even a responsibility. And if it's not done on the positive side with friendship and encouragement, you've got no currency with which to give effective reproof. If there's no friendship, no positive thinking and planning and conversation and help, and guidance and encouragement and friendship, then there's no basis for reproof. All one does is stir up resentment and hostility. So are we following the full syllabus? Because I can speak to you. I, I had children many, many years ago, and they now all have children. So I'm being wise after the event. However, even at that level, dear friends, it's so important, fathers, be a friend before you're a reprover. But when you're a reprover, be kindly and reasonable. Never reprove out of temper or irritation or annoyance. Go and count ten or a hundred and come back in a better spirit and reprove well, sensibly and kindly and properly and firmly, yes. But all these things are challenges to us. Even in a pagan society among the Thessalonians, a pagan society, Paul could assume that many typical fathers were interested in their children. 
and concerned for their children. And he could use even heathen fathers in his illustration here when he says, as ye know how we exhorted, implored, and comforted and charged every one of you as a father, typically, he almost says, does his children. Now, in a believing society, is it possible we don't care enough as parents and we aren't in touch and we aren't sympathetic enough and connected enough? Even in a pagan society, the example could be given. So it's a challenge to us. And look at the balance of verse 11. The father in verse 11 doesn't just reprove, he does everything. He calls near, he implores, he comforts, and he charges. So he does it all, not just a bit of it. But anyway, I would like to go on to verse 12 and look briefly at the aim of the evangelists in the city of the Thessalonians. Verse 12, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Their aim <coughs> was that the converts would go on to have a consistent and an assured walk with the Lord. They would, their walk would be consistent, that ye would walk worthy of God, fittingly or appropriately, in harmony with God. There'd be a work of grace in their lives, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. That's a wonderful word. The call of God, who hath called you. Have we been called? Are we conscious of being those who are called by God? How do you look at salvation? Oh, I heard the gospel. I felt I was a sinner. I needed a savior. I repented of my sin. I trusted in Christ. He changed my heart and life. And I follow him. Yes, but let me give you an even richer biblical way of looking at your salvation. I heard the call of Christ. The gospel came to me as a summons, a call, personally. I was called to come out of my sin and to trust in Christ for salvation. He spoke to me. I will save you, I will forgive you and cleanse you, I will give you new life, I will make you mine. That's an even richer way of looking at it. That's the biblical way of looking at it. Those who are called, I have heard a personal call and I couldn't let it go and I tried to resist and I wanted to stay with the world and my personal ambitions and everything else. But there was a call and it had summoned me and it had attached itself to my heart and I had to respond. It was a call of the Saviour who died in love for a wretch like me. That's how you need to look at salvation. That ye could walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Astonishing. We sinners, nothing at all. Offensive to him, far from him, nothing to offer him, nothing to give. He called us and drew us to himself and saved us by mercy and grace alone. And now every step we take, we are the called according to his electing mercy and grace. Our lives are his, and we must follow him and seek his will in everything we do. And the aim of the evangelists was to see people all the way through to that certainty that they were the called of Jesus Christ on the way to eternal glory, where they would see him who had called them and led them all the way through. 
that ye would walk worthy of God as if under his eye, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. That's the aim of the apostles, to bring them into that state and condition. And now I come to the 13th verse and this next stage, and this is the heart of the miracle. Really, it starts the process in the heart, but here it is. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. I'll come to that in a moment. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Here's the miracle. Their eyes were opened and they grasped that the word that the evangelists preached was the word of God. This is a tremendous thing. It's called illumination. The illumination of the spirit. In the New Testament we read it described as an anointing which comes from above. It's an amazing realization that this word is authentic and it's true and it's the word of God. <clears throat> One moment you're thinking to yourself, why do the Christians make so much of the Bible? It's just a very old book. Yes, it's a rather extraordinary and wonderful book, but that's what it is. They say it's divine. But how do they know? They can tell me various things about it that prove or seem to prove that it has special characteristics, that it has a uniqueness. Yes, I'm very impressed, we think, to hear that it was composed over a period of about 1,600 years by so many different authors. And yet, amazingly, unlike any other human literature, it has one theme. And it all adds up. That is certainly astonishing. If I look at the literature of, say, a political movement, whether it's the labor movement or the conservative movement, over a period of only 50 years, I see that there, many of their ideas, some fundamentals may that change, but many of their ideas evolve and move and change. And their parties are quite different now from how they were 50 years ago, with so many views have radically altered. But you look at the Bible, compiled over a far, far, far longer period of time, and not just in one or two fundamentals, but in so many major doctrines and respects, everything it says, it's unchanged. It has one theme and various other lesser themes, and through they go, identical, all the way, with an amazing... That is, that is certainly astonishing. How could that ever have happened? Without endless committees constantly revising it and trying to keep it on the track, and they haven't been. Yes, people can tell me astonishing things about the Bible and its uniqueness, but still, you think one moment, that doesn't altogether convince me. Why do they trust it so? Why is it right? Why is this message it and the solution to all our problems and reconciliation with God? And then there's a change. Through the hearing or the reading of the Bible and seeking after God, suddenly, overnight almost, a new conviction has dawned. This is divine. This is true. This has a moral demand upon me. I am under its authority. It is special. It is infallible. When did I begin to think like this? When did I grasp this? When did I feel this? It was imperceptible, but it dawned on me. And I found whatever problem I had with it, it could be resolved. I found this book had an amazing power.
power and integrity. I saw its divine character. I saw the doctrine of salvation. I saw the principle of grace, that salvation is free and unearned, secured by the work of Jesus Christ. I saw its perfections, its deep things, its promises, its comforts. No other literature speaks like this with such authority about heaven and hell and eternity and the soul. I saw its supremacy over all human literature. I remember the case of a gentleman, young, youngish man, who was doing extremely well in his career, a man with a brilliant mind, very thoughtful. I go back about 20, 25 years. And he believed in the doctrines of the Bible. He believed these things. And he thought he was saved. But he had this great problem. And his problem was, uh, yes, but I don't think I should yield my mind to something which I cannot rationally prove. And I cannot totally, adequately, rationally prove the veracity of the Christian faith and the spiritual perfection of the word of God. Or no, because these things are received by faith. But he had this nagging doubt and it held him up terribly. And do you know what the problem was, really? He hadn't received that miracle. That anointing which just opens your eyes to the divine reality of God's revelation of the scripture. Now, even after you've had that, the devil can sow doubts in your mind. And of course, because of our limited human understanding, we shall have some problems which we shall seek to resolve in the right spirit, I hope. Don't be that we'll understand everything and never again be susceptible to temptation and doubt. But there's this tremendous difference as we grasp that it is indeed the word of God. It's part of the miracle of conversion. But it's almost the first great sign of it, the illumination, the anointing of the spirit and this is what the apostle refers to here. For this cause, he's going to mention it. Thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us. Ordinary human instruments. Ye received it not as the word of men. But as it is in truth the word of God. Which effectually worketh also in them that believe. It's so different from the word of men. They were educated pagans. This was one of the most advanced pagan cities in the Greek world. I say the Greek world, it was under, of course, the rule of the Roman Empire. The Greeks were polytheists. They believed in the 12 gods of Mount Olympus and sometimes others beside. They looked all through their lives for signs and omens, good signs, good omens of fortune. They were intensely superstitious. The, uh, the ruling power in the Greek pagan world was fate. Fate was greater than the gods. They had their city gods, their local gods. But even the gods were powerless before fate. Fate was something that happened. The gods couldn't affect it, couldn't manipulate it, couldn't direct it. Fate ruled. None of their gods were almighty. None of their gods were even remotely holy. They were experts in their gods. Now comes the preacher, an old man, an exhausted, recently beaten, and he's preaching one almighty, holy God, a brand new concept. And as they hear the preachers, they know that this is true. 
and that they are preaching the word, that's a miracle of God. God is at work in their lives and they grasp the fall of man, the holiness of God, the alienation of man by the fall, his desperate need of forgiveness and new life, Christ's work on Calvary, and this is the message of God, and it's authentic. They're hearing it only from men, but they understand it is God. So important, by the way, for the preacher not to obscure the word. Sometimes the preacher can be tempted. He can use far too many illustrations. He can dazzle his hearers with wonderful illustrations. Be careful. He may actually not be helping the understanding of the word of God. He may be obscuring it. He may be giving the people something which has its own intrinsic interest and fascination and makes the, commends the preacher in his excellent telling of the stories. Of course, he's bound to give illustrations. We're not against them. But he better be careful not to obscure the word of God because if the Holy Spirit moves, it will be to authenticate the word of God. That must be the major part of his preaching. Well, dear friends, the miracle had taken place and the evidence of the miracle is here too. The apostle under inspiration is careful to tell us everything. But as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The apostle wouldn't have been impressed with some converts who say that they've come to Christ and they become very interested in the doctrines but their lives are unchanged and their new character is not to be seen and they fall easily into sin and they're cold fish. No, he's interested in a new attitude to scripture which is proved by the fact that it's effectually at work in them. It changes them. It makes them new people. It puts them hungering and thirsting after righteousness, desirous to please and to serve the Lord. So it's all there. He said it all. And then finally, because our time is up, the beginning of verse 13, for this calls also, thank we God without ceasing. Oh, you must thank God as individuals and we must thank God in our prayer meetings and as a congregation constantly for the miracle of grace which opens eyes and enables people to see and to grasp the message and the scriptures. Praise and thank God for illumination. If we don't thank him, except occasionally and limply, now and then, if we don't praise and thank him, this is what happens. We begin to be open to the temptation that we have done it. The effectiveness of our preaching has opened minds. The effectiveness of our teaching has brought teenagers to the Lord. We begin to think it's something to do with us. The mighty apostle didn't make that mistake. He said, thank we God constantly, continuously. We never stop. It's God who's done it. He opens the mind. How much we need him. We're dependent upon him. So he didn't become foolish and self-confident and self-reliant and proud. It's vital that the people praise God too. Because otherwise, the Holy Spirit will withdraw. God is not receiving the glory for his mighty and his wonderful and his merciful works. So we praise him when eyes are opened, when minds are opened and changed. And the apostle puts it like this, 
for this cause also. Thank we God without ceasing. All of them, Paul, Silas, Timothy, the congregation, thank we God without ceasing. So that's our message, dear friends, for this morning. It's just a glimpse of the mission work in the city of the Thessalonians, the foundation of hard work that was necessary as part of it. The spirit of the evangelists, they wanted to reach the people and speak to them and persuade them. The aim of the evangelists, not that hit and run mass evangelism, walk the aisle, come forward, raise your hand, claim the numbers, and when then we'll be on our way. But they wanted people to really find the Lord and prove him and have him for themselves and walk with him. And so they wanted consistent Christian living. And then the word of God, <clears throat> the great miracle wrought by the Spirit, the new attitude to the word and the thankfulness of the apostles and the church which never wavered. So there's an example of the mission that we seek to follow in our day. <clears throat> Dear friends, let's close singing.